Welcome to Castle Hill this week and welcome to worship. Let's take a moment to pray. Loving God, bound up in this world with all your people, may we create a space here where the love you are and the love you shape, the love with which you speak, opens, gathers and calls us as your people, individuals but renamed as a family, lonely and isolated but included back into community, experiencing hurt, but finding our healing together, loving God wherever we are. This is our meeting place. We bring who we are and all that we are. Those times we have stood back, turned away, and those times when backs have been turned on us. In such places, may we speak a fresh word, that begins with hope and grows into love, not just for our own ears, but for the ears of all, all your greater family. So be it. Amen. Listen for a word from God now, from Matthew's, Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, at verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him, and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Amen. The different Gospels tell that story in different ways. Matthew shows Jesus arriving on the scene with a new teaching with the Sermon of the Mount. John has Jesus full of abundance and party spirit with wine from water. Luke has Jesus release the captive and set the prisoner free. In Mark he seems to pick a fight now, remember, the writers of the Gospels are artists rather than historians. They tell a story in a particular way, offering pictures to explore meaning rather than a stream of facts. So ours is to notice the picture the story paints rather than the details of what happens. The first thing Jesus does is confront everything that robs a person of the fullness of life. The man possessed is such a character. He has been limited, reduced, oppressed, and there is immediate conflict. Now, picking the fight is maybe not quite the first thing Jesus does. The first thing he does is to preach. Then he confronts the world. That's more significant. One leads to the other. Read the word and find yourself confronting the world. Hear the good news and immediately stumble into places where the world doesn't mirror the gospel promise. Confronted with the places where that news of the fullness of life is bound up. Many people over the years have made the comment that you can't read the Bible without having a newspaper in the other hand. Earth it in the present. Read the Bible and you can't help but find yourself in confrontation with what the world has done with the world. And what better time to reflect on that than now, still in the midst of a global pandemic. As God's people, might we take this time when church is not meeting face to face to hear these gospel stories again and amongst the grief and hurt and loneliness and hunger 
and anxiety of the world. Maybe we dare hear the subtle invitation that this story makes to consider as a church what are we led to confront as God's people. One day we will get back into our buildings where we can classically be church again and hear these familiar stories and traditional surroundings. When? We don't know. But on hearing this word today, we want to remember the nature of the gospel leads us out of the buildings into the world to confront the places where the fullness of life, now bound up, is still to be set free. The reality of our call shifts us from gospel to the world, from church to community, from listening to being. Here is the word that leads not back to the church, but into the world. And we don't have to wait until the buildings reopen to hear that challenge. Two headlines caught my attention this week. We passed 100,000 deaths from COVID-19 in the United Kingdom. It's evident the tally has not stopped. In response, the media has been story searching, asking relatives and friends of those who died for their hardest feelings. The toll is tragic and we mourn with all who have died and who have suffered bereavement. I wonder though, is it really appropriate to intrude on raw grief and broadcast it to the world at such an early stage? Encourage people to grieve, we must, but quietly, privately, safely, letting them express their emotions without confusing them with feelings of retribution or allocation of blame, which is seldom apt. Is there not a risk with such interviews of wide-scale secondary traumatisation amongst the general populations whose homes right now might be receiving few other visitors? That's the sort of suffering that our health professionals, paramedics, police, emergency services and other witnesses experience at the time of tragedy. It's when we take somebody else's story into our story. It doesn't help us, it doesn't help them. The time for inquiry and investigation into the nature of the pandemic and the processing of it is not now. Our leaders need to be free to face the challenges of dealing with it without accusation. The second headline this week saw the marking of the Holocaust Remembrance Day. It features, fortunately, in the curriculum of our schools now. One of the last assemblies I did last year in our secondary schools was on this subject. This year I discovered a lady called Edith Eger who, a ballerina, was taken at the age of 16 to Auschwitz and witnessed multiple loss and major suffering there. If you haven't come across her, can I urge you to seek her out in her writings or her talks on YouTube. She was someone who faced the worst sort of pain this world can throw at a person. And she writes, I want to say there is no hierarchy of suffering. There is nothing that makes my pain worse or better than yours. People say to me, things in my life are pretty hard right now, but I've no right to complain. It's not Auschwitz. This kind of comparison can lead us to minimise or diminish our own suffering. Being or becoming a survivor requires absolute acceptance of what was and what is. If we discount our pain or punish ourselves for feeling lost or isolated or scared about the challenges of our lives in this pandemic, we are choosing to be victims. 
survivors don't have the time to ask why me. The only relevant question is what now? Edith Ager survived Auschwitz because she was still alive on a pile of bodies when liberating forces came. She was so weak the only way she could attract their attention was to do what she was good at, dancing moves, which brought her to the top of the pile, caught their attention and brought her to safety. Dancing may not be our chosen skill, but being there for each other, listening, supporting within the community, even if we cannot be active out in the community, is one attribute I would suggest that every church has and has to cultivate at this time of our imprisonment. Whenever you are feeling down, as we all do, ask yourself, what now? And we're back at the beginning of the gospel, ready to re-encounter the community when the time is right, with hope. Let's pray. Loving God, sending us out with the word in our ears and the world to love, may you find us in the places and among the neighbourhoods you call us to be. This week, remembering Holocaust and the loss of love, countries unavailable, un unable to afford vaccines, communities where levelling has been downward, governments struggling to find a balanced way, neighbourhoods where loneliness and anxiety seem to have taken root, young people in and out of education and all their mental health concerns, our hospitals so full, such a long list, O oh God, but may our prayers not be a list but a call, not to ask for something but to be something, May we be your word, may we live your hope, may we share your intent, offer your compassion, embody your love. This is our prayer to confront the world with good news, with self-giving love, to challenge the world with truth and peace, to take on the world with hope and vision. This is our prayer that our prayers run out of words and our actions become faith events. In such a prayer we pause, let go the words and remember those closest to us, hurting the most, grieving, worried, frightened, ill. You hold them in love. Let them know it. Amen. Go and live peace. May the good news call and may we hear. May love call and may we follow. May God call and may we join God in the world. And as we all receive God's blessing, so may we be sources of blessing to others on God's behalf and with God's help. Always. Amen. Listen to the hymn that's been recorded in the bulb there is a flower. Follow the words, act them out, get a bulb or a seed, plant it and help it grow. Count the hours of daylight each day, spring is coming. Listen for how many arms have been bared for the jag this week. If you can't see birds in your garden this weekend as we have been asked to, Put some bird feed out. Even the seagulls get hungry. Listen for bird song in the silence. And read again verse 3 of that hymn by Natalie Sleet. Be safe, take care and God bless. <laughs>